And let's talk about iron briefly. We mentioned iron is a complex. We'll have to do a whole separate podcast on yeah, iron. And, and I've talked about iron somewhat because I got interested in my iron status in the past. I've, I wonder, after listening to your stuff, I wonder if a lifetime of copper deficiency or perhaps I just have a genetic predisposition to overly absorbing iron. Right. Obviously, there's a lot of iron in my diet. I eat a lot of meat and organs. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, but my ferritin was at times over 300. So okay. I did start doing phlebotomy. And, yeah. and, and now my ferritin is much lower. Um, I think it's 70 or 60 now. Um, and, and there are definitely ways to do phlebotomy, but it was interesting thinking like, what, how do I, you know, maybe get rid of, is this a lifetime of over avid consumption of iron and not enough copper elevating the ferritin light chain as we saw or what, but I did, I did phlebotomy and it's interesting, um, that it's lowered that. And then, so the, the, the labs that I looked at, and again, this is quite complex for people where the ferritin, the serum iron, the transferrin saturation, right. um, and then I'm trying to think if there's anything else. What, what do you look at for iron? You look at ferritin, those transferrin, that, serum iron. So let, let's walk people through the containers of iron. There's yeah, yeah, two, please. There's, th there's three of them in the body. The biggest container is a bucket. It's a bucket of iron, and it's called hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. And that's 70% of the iron in the body. If you throw in myoglobin in the muscle, that's another 10%. So we've got 80% of iron is tied up in these proteins that are carrying oxygen. They're dumber than a box of rocks. All they do is carry oxygen and then, of course, carry CO2 on the way back. But the, but the thing is, this enormous bucket of, of iron is in the hemoglobin. Then we have a teacup. The teacup of iron is about 10% of the iron in the body is tied up in a storage protein called ferritin. Now, <laughs> are you standing or sitting? I'm sitting. Okay, good. Because I didn't want you to fall when I said that. Oh, well. the, um, there's three forms of ferrit ferritin in the body. Okay? There's heavy chain, which is found principally in the heart and the kidney, but it's also found in the cells, but it's also found in the nucleus of the cells. Well, heavy chain is like an ATM machine. Put iron in, take it out. Put it in, take it out. And that function requires bioavailable copper. And the reason why it's called heavy chain is because copper is a heavy metal. Now, what, if, if you want to go geek, start looking in your medical textbooks, and you'll see other references to other heavy proteins. Every one of them has a connection to copper. Hmm. So ferritin heavy chain is very different than ferritin then ferritin light chain. And light chain, again, as we were talking about earlier, uh, relates to liver, spleen, principally. And then there's a third form of ferritin called secreted ferritin, and that's what shows up in a blood test, right? And we can thank Jacobs et al., 1972, British Medical Journal, for introducing us to serum ferritin. It's a very important pro storage protein because up until that time, everyone knew that hemoglobin was how you measured iron status because it was mm. the circulating iron, not the stored iron. Everything flipped in 1972, and all the optics went to storage, and let's forget about the circulating, which is that was a tragedy uh, of, of biblical proportions. <clears throat> But here's the part that most people don't know about secreted ferritin. I like, I like to see it around 20. The bells go off for a woman at 150, off for a man at 300. And many years ago, I was having a conversation with Douglas Kell, who's a world-renowned iron expert. He's got more, more initials than I have in my name. And um, I said, Dr. Kell. What's the ideal ferritin for a human being? Now, you got to picture this very affable guy. He's my age with this wall of books behind him. And he smiles and he says, zero. I went, what? And then he proceeded to say something that I'll never forget. He said, Morley, I want to make sure you understand this. He said, rising ferritin in the body is not a sign of iron vitality. It's a sign of organ pathophysiology. Do you understand that? I said, yes, sir, I do, because I've read many of your articles. And one of his signature articles, Paul, is 2,400 footnotes. And what he's telling his, his peers and his, his uh, people who follow him, you're not just wrong about iron. 
you're dead wrong. And ferritin should not be obsessed over. And it turns out, I just learned recently, where does ferritin, the secreted form, the one that shows up in the blood, where does it actually originate? It originates in the spleen. And when the spleen is turning over two and a half million red blood cells a second, all day long, all night long, two and a half million red blood cells a second, it opens up the red blood cell, and guess what comes out? Ferritin and a lot of glycated hemoglobin, right? And so, and a bunch of other stuff, obviously. But the but the the ferritin is coming out of the spleen. And my evolving thinking about ferritin is it's not it's not really telling us what's going on with iron. It's telling us what's going on with the spleen. It's a barometer for spleen. And here's the part that you're going to find absolutely unnerving is that this secreted uh, ferritin, this is according to people like Douglas Kell, Arosio, Moore Wood. There's a dozen different articles that I've identified. Um, Torty and Torty, famous husband and wife team. Um, serum ferritin is empty shotgun shells. Hmm. The iron has already been discharged in the spleen, into the macrophage in the spleen. And what's coming out, what's being secreted, is an abridged form of light chain. It's missing 10 amino acids. And that's why it's called secreted ferritin, because ferritin's supposed to be inside our cells. It's not supposed to be in the blood. And so it's a very um, important thing for people to understand. And then the third bucket, so we've got the, we've got the bucket, we've got the teacup, and then we have a thimble. The thimble is 1% of the iron. And it's called serum iron, or sometimes total iron. But it's one of the most important irons to know because it's telling us what's the status of the recycling iron. Again, that's being turned over two and a half million times per second. And the iron gets discharged in the red pulp macrophages. I'm taking you back to your your, your medical school physiology. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I won't test you on the uh, the white pulp milk macrophage. We'll just do red pulp. Yeah. Yeah. But but the red pulp are intensely involved in this process, and they've got to keep track of what's happening to iron. And the iron leaves the macrophage through the doorway called ferroportin, iron doorway. And guess who the doorman is? It's a copper doorman that opens that doorway to let the iron out to get connected to transferrin, which is the transport protein for iron, that takes it down to the bone marrow. What's happening in the bone marrow? Well, they're making red blood cells at two and a half million times a second. And so that iron has got to get down there as fast as it can. And so <clears throat> copper is allowing the iron out and enabling the attachment to transferrin it attaches to transferrin two and a half times faster in the presence of copper than it does without it. And so this, um, in a man, the serum, fer excuse me, serum iron should be about 120. In a woman, it should be about 100. And when you do a blood test, uh, it's easier for a guy because we don't have a menstrual cycle, right? And so if your serum iron is not at 120 and it's well below that, it means your recycling program is not efficient. That's mm. a good thing to know. For a woman, they've they've got to do their, their blood test on day 15 of their cycle, the midpoint. Mm -hmm. And so they have a more accurate indication. And so depending upon where they are in their cycle, it's going to have a massive impact on their iron status. Right. Right? I mean, it makes so much sense intuitively. And so women who are postmenopausal, again, it's easy. It should be 100. But um, what you're going to find is a lot of women who are cycling, they might have their serum iron might be in the 20s or 30s. And, the, and a, uh, an aggressive uh, practitioner might say, you're anemic, when in fact they should be saying, why is it so low? And is there enough bioavailable copper? in your body to regulate the movement, the, the recycling, and 
before we go to iron supplements and iron infusions, we should exhaust all possibilities of copper-rich foods like you're talking about and where appropriate, maybe some copper supplements. But the need to understand the copper side of the house is paramount. And so the iron markers are useful, but they can't be evaluated in the absence of understanding the copper side. And that's the mistake that's made in so many doctors' offices is they have no knowledge about what's happening with copper. Do you think there's a lot of iron deficiency that's misdiagnosed? Or should I say a lot of anemia that's misdiagnosed as iron deficiency without attention to copper status then? There's there's two principal labels for de- for anemia. There's right. iron deficiency anemia, which the World Health Organization, I think the latest article is 2012, tells us it's the most prevalent nutrient deficiency on the planet. Uh, there's more to the story. So what I think the second form of anemia is called chronic disease anemia, sometimes called uh, uh, chronic inflammation. But CDA also stands for copper deficiency anemia. And I think that's the dominant form of anemia on the planet because think about it. Think about it. Iron's the number one element. We're fortifying food everywhere with it. It's, it's in every supplement. And yet people are anemic. No, that's not possible. And so there's a missing piece of the puzzle. And in fact, it was uh, Bruce Ames in 2004, famed researcher at uh, UC Berkeley. At the peak of his career, he was the most quoted scientist on planet Earth. And in 2004, he did a a major study with his colleague, uh, David Kalilia, and they were studying fibroblasts. And what they discovered is that there can be 10 times more iron in the tissue than shows up in the blood. Well, that 2004 study should have had a shockwave through doctor schools all over the planet. Mm -hmm. And what did they do with that study? They stored it with the Ark of the Covenant in the Indiana Jones warehouse. <laughs> and, and nobody knows about it. And, and this, there's a pervasive myth that everyone's anemic when, in fact, we're all uh, copper-deprived, copper and that's causing us to have high iron. 